Hey everybody, welcome to Coughlin for tonight, uh, August the 10th. Uh, yeah, we've rounded the corner well and truly through the summer. It's hard to believe that we're well into August. I'm looking out my big picture window this way and uh, what was still bright and uh, pre, pre even twilight um, or pre dusk at uh, this time about six weeks ago is dark now. So welcome Heidi, thanks for joining in tonight. Hey Carrie, blessings to you. Welcome Robin, peace be with you. Katika, blessings. Uh, so tonight our, we have another long psalm. We're through. I haven't, this is one of the neat things when you um, read in fairly quick succession through an entire book of the Bible, you notice things that you don't when you're just dabbling here and there. And uh, I'd never noticed this section of long psalms kind of going back to, yeah, really to, to Psalm 102. Um, tonight's another long one in one, 107. And then we're back to some shorter ones as we inch up to the longest Psalm, um, the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. Uh, yeah. So we're training, I guess, for that marathon. Welcome, PD. Yeah, I was just speaking with my my mom. So, PD, thanks for the the hard to call it praise uh, report. Just because we know Donna is in rough shape, but uh, everyone, I just want you to know that uh, the woman that we prayed for last night, who had been missing for 30 hours on her property um, near Strathmore, was found alive. Um, she was hypothermic and dehydrated, so it sounds like an issue where an older person who has maybe a little bit of dementia um, got turned around and lost, and so we're just so thankful for that answer to prayer that the, those who sought found. Um, hallelujah for that. Thanks for that good news, PD, and we'll continue to hold up Donna and her family as they go through the next steps of this ordeal. Welcome, Alan. Yeah, peace, Karen. Thanks for joining in. So Psalm 107 tonight, and uh, I think we'll sing tonight number 805, Lead On, O King Eternal. Welcome, Grover. Good to see you again, brother. Uh, so let's begin with a brief word of prayer in the way it's good and wise to begin all things under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, Tammy. Thanks for joining in tonight. Marilyn and Irene, peace be with you. Gracious and holy God, give us diligence to seek you, wisdom to perceive you, and patience to wait for you. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on you, eyes to behold you, ears to listen for your word, and a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. So we begin uh, our Compline service. Almighty God, grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Friends, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. I confess to God Almighty before the whole company of heaven, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned by my own fault in thought, word, and deed. I pray, God Almighty, to have mercy on me, 
Forgive me all my sins and bring me to everlasting life. Receive these words of assurance. Almighty and merciful God grant you healing, pardon, and forgiveness for all your sins. Amen. Psalm 107. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord proclaim that God redeemed them from the hand of the foe, gathering them in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes. They found no path to a city where they might dwell. They were hungry and thirsty. Their spirits languished within them, and then they, in their trouble, cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You led them on a straight path to go to a city where they might dwell. Let them give thanks to you, O Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. For you satisfy the thirsty soul and fill the hungry with good things. Some dwelt in darkness and gloom, prisoners in misery and irons. Because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, so you humbled their hearts with hard labor. They stumbled, and there was none to help. Then, in their trouble, they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You led them out of darkness and gloom and broke their bonds asunder. Let them give thanks to you, O Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. For you shatter the doors of bronze and break the iron bars in two. Some were fools and took rebellious paths. Through their sins they were afflicted. They loathed all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then, in their trouble, they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You sent forth your word and healed them and rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of your deeds with shouts of joy. Some went down to the sea in ships, plying their trade in deep waters. They beheld the works of the Lord, God's wonderful works in the deep. And then God spoke, and a stormy wind arose, which tossed high the waves of the sea. They mounted up to the heavens and descended to the depths. Their souls melted away in their peril. They staggered and reeled like drunkards, and all their skill was of no avail. Then... In their trouble they cried to the Lord, and you delivered them from their distress. You stilled the storm to a whisper and silenced the waves of the sea. Then, then were they glad when it grew calm, when you guided them to the harbor they desired. Let them give thanks to you, Lord, for your steadfast love and your wonderful works for all people. Let them exalt you in the assembly of the peoples and the council of the elders. Let them sing hallelujah. You change rivers into deserts and water springs into thirsty ground. Fruitful land into salty waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell there. You change deserts into pools of water and dry land into water springs. You settle the hungry there and they establish a city to dwell in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and bring in a fruitful harvest. By your blessing, they increase greatly. You do not let their herds decrease. And yet, when they are diminished and brought low through oppression, trouble, and sorrow, you, you pour contempt on princes and make them wander in trackless wastes. But you lift up the poor out of misery and multiply their families like flocks of sheep. The upright see this and rejoice, 
but all wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise will ponder these things and consider well the Lord's steadfast love. Let's sing together, Lead On, O King Eternal. Rose, welcome. Karen says, I always like the pattern of this psalm, one story after another, especially the story about those who went down to the sea in ships. Only a small portion appears in the lectionary. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I was thinking um, that psalm really lends itself, it invites the reader or the singer into it, right? Like I was thinking we could almost have a verse like, um, Lord, you, your people um, worried and searched for their elder uh, in, uh, in rural places uh, without much hope for finding, but you brought that elder home and restored her to her family and kept her safe and uh, you know each of us probably has multiple verses that we could add to that psalm of times when we felt um, adrift under threat persecuted um, let down but we can also having lived through it testify how God has been present and brought us through it welcome Michelle Thanks for being with us. So let's uh, let's sing this prayer. Lead on, O King Eternal. Uh, full of hope that whatever crisis, uh, whatever heartache, whatever difficulty we're in the midst of today, God will and does lead us through. So the tune goes like this. the 
us lead on, O God of might. You, O Lord, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us, O Lord, our God. Jesus says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you that are weary, and all who are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, It is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone. Shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. Your part of the responsory goes like this. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Guide us, waking, O Lord, and guard us sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a lie to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people, Israel. Guide us, waking, O Lord, and guard us, sleeping, that awake we may watch with Christ, and asleep we may rest in peace. Friends, for what and for whom shall we pray for this night? Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. In righteousness I shall see you. When I awake, your presence will give me joy.
Welcome, Madeline. I didn't see you sneak in there. Thanks for joining us tonight, Maddie. Uh, Lord, we want to lift up to you together with PD and uh, the Sebek family, Donna. We give you thanks, O oh God, uh, for Donna was lost and now she is found. She was in, in peril and now she is safe. She was cold and now she is warm. She was confused and now she is comforted and consoled. Lord, we give you thanks. You found her, I'm sure, before anyone else. In fact, we take heart that in you she was never lost. Thank you for connecting her with those who searched for her. Thank you that they found her in time. We pray that you would continue to hover over her extending your healing hands, your merciful heart. Lord, bring her back to health and wholeness. Surround her uh, in the ways that we can during these days of COVID with family and loved ones who can console her and help her to make sense of the situation. Lord, we lift up to you, Leona, another elder, uh, and we lift her up together with Anne-Marie and the people of uh, Spruce Grove. We pray that you would uh, continue to bring to completion the healing that you've already begun in her hip and in her wrist. Lord, we pray that you would comfort and console her. Pray for the Lance family, that you would continue to draw them together and teach them it's okay to lean on one another uh, and to laugh when they need to laugh and cry and weep when they need to do that. Pray that you would continue to surround them with ample care and support. And through them we pray, Lord, for all who grieve in these days, more than in recent memory is the grief that weighs upon our lands. And yet in you, Lord, we find grace and inspiration to trust and to hope and not to become so preoccupied with our own difficulties that we uh, forget to attend to the difficulties of others. And so we lift up to you, the people of Beirut, 300,000 homeless, Homes destroyed in an instant, in a blast. Jesus, you know what it's like uh, to have no place to rest your head. Jesus, many there, and indeed closer to home, uh, hunger and thirst. And you say that you are the bread of eternal life and that you have water to offer, that when we drink of it, we shall never thirst again. Lord, we pray that all would know this amazing grace, this beautiful truth. We lift up to you our care agencies, the Canadian Food Grains Bank, the Canadian Lutheran World Relief, the ACT Alliance, and so many others doing good work, Lord on the ground in Lebanon and around the world. We, together with our sister Robin, we continue to lift in our prayers her friend Kim. We give you thanks for each small grace. Uh, we celebrate, Lord, on not just the miraculous 100% healings, but every bit of health and wholeness, every bit of peace, 
uh, that defies the illness and despair that threatens. We continue to pray for Kim and her family, the medical specialists and all healthcare providers who are there every day for all patients. And Lord, we lift up to you in your sight the, uh, the testing process. Um, for blood testing and, uh, and bone marrow testing, Lord, that uh, Kim holds out hope for a possible stem cell treatment. Lord, we pray that a match would be found. We give thanks, Lord, that on our worst days, when we feel like we have little to offer, we have this amazing gift of life coursing literally through our bodies. And we have power and agency to share that gift of life with others. So inspire us to make gifts not only of our tithes and offerings, of our serving hands, uh, but of our blood, of our plasma, of our marrow, where that is good possible and healthy in order to thrive life following your example. We pray together with Tammy for Charlie's family. We lift up to you his sister Agnes and all who grieve for Charlie. Lord, amidst the storm of grief, we pray for grace to ride it out. We thank you for standing alongside us in times of sadness. We trust you, O Lord, to bring us through We give you thanks for the way that you have vouchsafed and promised to care for our loved ones, for Charlie. This gives us consolation and the hope we need, Lord, to continue to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fearing no evil, following your voice, your step, your light. Almighty God, you have given us this good land as our heritage. Make us always to remember your generosity and constantly to do your will. Bless our lands with honesty in the workplace, truth in education, honor in daily life, integrity from our public officials. Save us from violence, discord, confusion, and injustice. Save us from pride and arrogance and from every evil course of action. When times are prosperous, let our hearts be thankful and in troubled times. Do not let our trust in you fail. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Holy Trinity, one God, you show us the splendor of diversity and beauty of unity in your own divine life. Make us, who came from many nations with many languages, a united people that delights in our many different gifts. Defend our liberties and give those whom we have entrusted with authority the spirit of wisdom, that there might be justice and peace in our land. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our sovereign and savior. Amen. Be present, merciful God, and protect us through the hours of this night 
so that we who are wearied by the changes and chances of life may find our rest in you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day, especially for the good we were permitted to give and to receive. The day is now past, and we commit it to you. We entrust to you the night, and we rest securely, for you are our help, and you neither slumber nor sleep. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who teaches us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty and merciful God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep us this night and forevermore. Amen. Good night, friends. Uh, go in peace to sleep and rest tonight and resting root so that rooted in God's goodness, presence, and mercy, you might rise to do his will and to love one another. Amen. Good night, Katika. Good night, Tammy and Karen. Good night, Robin. Thanks for the um, prayers for traveling mercies, everybody, especially Karen. Um, blessings, Tammy. Peace be with you, Robin and Rose, Michelle. Blessings, Marilyn and Irene. Good night, PD. Peace be with you. Blessings, Brother Grover. Good night, bud. Good night, Alan. Peace be with you, Madeline. Night, Carrie and Curtis. Didn't see you guys sneak in either. Hey, Heidi, blessings to you. Good night, Robin and Katika. Now for your bedtime story, chapter 10 of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce. So last night, our narrator finally met his own guide, and in a nod to, uh, I think, Div Dante's Divine Comedy, yeah, uh, Beatrice is the guide there. Um, C.S. Lewis has uh, tapped another poet, George MacDonald, as his guide into the land of the light. So we heard a lot of that Scottish brogue last night. Chapter 10. This conversation also we overheard. That is quite, quite out of the question, said a female ghost. To one of the bright women. I should not dream of staying if I'm expected to meet Robert. I'm ready to forgive him, of course, but anything more is quite impossible. How he comes to be here, but that is your affair. But if you have forgiven him, said the other, surely I forgive him as a Christian, said the ghost. But there are some things one can never forget. But I don't understand, began the she-spirit. Exactly, said the ghost with a little laugh. You never did. You always thought Robert could do no wrong, I know. 
Please don't interrupt me for one moment. You haven't the faintest conception of what I went through with your dear Robert. The ingratitude. It was I who made a man of him, sacrificed my whole life to him, and what was my reward? Absolute, utter selfishness. No, but listen, he was pottering along on about 600 a year when I married him, and mark my words, Hilda, he'd have been in that position to the day of his death if it hadn't been for me. It was I who had to drive him every step of the way. He hadn't a spark of ambition. It was like trying to lift a sack of coal. I had to positively nag him to take on that extra work in the other department, though it was really the beginning of everything for him, the laziness of that man. He said, if you please, he couldn't work more than 13 hours a day, as if I weren't working far longer, for my day's work wasn't over when his was. I had to keep him going all evening, if you understand what I mean. If he'd had his way, he'd have just sat in an armchair and sulked when dinner was over. It was I who made him who had to draw him out of himself and brighten him up and make him conversational. With no help from him, of course, sometimes he didn't even listen. As I said to him, I should have thought good manners, if nothing else, he seemed to have forgotten that I was a lady, even if I had married him. And all the time I was working my fingers to the bone for him. And without the slightest appreciation, I used to spend simply hours arranging flowers to make that pokey little house nice. And in saying to me, what did he say? He said he wished I wouldn't fill up the writing desk with them when he wanted to use it. And there was a perfectly frightful fuss one evening when I'd spilled one of the vases on some papers of his. It was all nonsense, really, because they weren't anything to do with his work. He had some silly idea of writing a book in those days, as if he could. I cured him of that in the end. No, Hilda, you must listen to me. The trouble I went to, entertaining? Robert's idea was that he'd just slink off by himself every now and then, see what he called his old friends, and leave me to amuse myself. But I knew from the first that those friends were doing him no good. No, Robert, said I, your friends are now mine. It is my duty to have them here, however tired I am and however little we can afford it. You'd have thought that would have been enough, but they did come for a bit. That is where I had to use a certain amount of tact. A woman who has her wits about her can always drop in a word here and there. I wanted Robert to see them against a different background. They weren't quite at their ease somehow in my drawing room, not at their best. I couldn't help laughing sometimes. Of course, Robert was uncomfortable while the treatment was going on, but it was all for his own good in the end. None of that set were friends for of his any longer by the end of the first year. And then he got the new job, a great step up. But what do you think? Instead of realizing that we now had a chance to spread out a bit, all he said was, well now, for God's sake, let's have some peace. That nearly finished me. I nearly gave up on him altogether, but I knew my duty. I've always done my duty. You can't believe the work I'd had getting him to agree to a bigger house and then finding a house. I wouldn't have grudged it if one scrap, if only he'd taken it in the right spirit, if only he'd seen the fun of it all. If he'd been a different sort of man, it would have been fun meeting him on the doorstep as he came back from the office and saying, Come along, Bobs. No time for dinner tonight. I've just heard of a house near Watford, and I've got the keys, and we can be there and back by one o'clock. But with him, it was perfect misery, Hilda. For by this time, your wonderful Robert was turning into the sort of man who cares about nothing but food. Well, I got him into the new house at last. Yes, I know. It was a little more than we could really afford at the moment, but all sorts of things were opening out before him. And of course, I began to entertain properly. No more of his sort of friends, thank you. I was doing it all for his sake. Every useful friend he ever made was due to me. Naturally, I had to dress well. They ought to have been the happiest years of both of our lives. If they weren't, he had no one to thank but himself. Oh, he was a maddening man, simply maddening. He just set himself to get old and silent and grumpy, just sank into himself. He could have looked years younger if he'd taken the trouble. He needn't have walked with a stoop. I'm sure I warned him about that often enough. He was the most miserable host. Whenever we gave a party, everything rested on my shoulders. Robert was simply a wet blanket. As I said to him, and if I said it once, I said it a hundred times, he hadn't always been like that. There had been a time when he took an interest in all sorts of things and had been really quite ready to make friends. What on earth is coming over you, I used to say. But now he just didn't answer at all. 
He would sit staring at me with his great big eyes. I came to hate a man with dark eyes, and, I know it now, just hating me, that was my reward. After all I'd done, sheer, wicked, senseless hatred, at the very moment when he was a richer man than he'd ever dreamed of being, as I used to say to him, Robert, you're simply letting yourself go to seed. The younger men who came to the house, it wasn't my fault if they liked me better than my old bear of a husband. They used to laugh at him. I did my duty to the very end. I forced him to take exercise. That was really my chief reason for keeping a great dame. I kept on giving parties. I took him for the most wonderful holidays. I saw that he didn't drink too much. Even when things became desperate, I encouraged him to take up his writing again. I couldn't do any harm by then. How could I help it if he did have a nervous breakdown in the end? My conscience is clear. I've done my duty by him if a woman ever has. So, you see why it would be impossible to. And yet, I don't know. I believe I have changed my mind. I'll make him a fair offer, Hilda. I will not meet him. If it means just meeting him and no more. But if I'm given a free hand, I'll take charge of him again. I will take up my burden once more, but I must have a free hand. With all the time one would have here, I believe I could still make something of him. Somewhere quite to ourselves, wouldn't that be a good plan? He's not fit to be on his own. Put me in charge of him. He wants firm handling. I know him better than you do. What's that? No. Give him to me. Do you hear? Don't consult him. Just give him to me. I'm his wife, aren't I? I was only beginning. There's lots, lots, lots of things I still want to do with him. No, listen, Hilda, please, 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 I'm so miserable. I must have something to do. It's simply frightful down there. No one minds at all about me. I can't alter them. It's dreadful to see them all sitting about, not being able to do anything with them. Give him back to me. Why should he have everything his own way? It's no good for him. It isn't right. It's not fair. I want Robert. What right have you to keep him from me? I hate you. How can I pay him out if you won't let me have him? The ghost, which had towered up like a dying candle flame, snapped suddenly. A sour, dry smell lingered in the air for a moment, and then there was no ghost to be seen. To be continued in chapter 11.